Hi everyone. It's great to be back this Wednesday uh, in spite of all of the chaos in our planet and the horror of the Bahama uh, mess from the Dorian and everything and it uh, makes me even want to hold more uh, a life form like Fluffy and Chocolate playing downstairs uh, close and say I'm so glad we're alive and we're together and it's Wednesday night and it's Earth Files YouTube broadcast. I'm going to let down this beautiful little guy and uh, I want to thank so much the dear Earth Files live stream audience for all your support. Our subscriptions have now exceeded 120,000. And I'm wearing one of my Down with Entropy, Up with Light t-shirts. And uh, I have felt that uh, this was one of those concepts that I had years ago about defeating entropy, which is the winding down of energy and replacing it with Up with Light, which is what this is about. And that uh, that means a great deal to me. I, I, I hope it does to you all too. We hopefully can replace some of the chaos in this planet with more and more light and love and peace. And for those of you who might want to get one of these t-shirts, you can go to my Earth File shop at www.earthfiles.com. And with this good news, I received an email from a person who simply signed, quote, in gratitude, peace, and love, a grateful student. And I love that concept that all of us are students with each other. We are students on this earth. We're students in this universe. We are students trying to understand our relationship with what I think is a divine field responsible for all that there is. And this grateful student wrote these words to me. Thank you, Linda, for all your work and efforts. It isn't wasted. So many good people are doing their parts for all of us. You are on the front line. You know you make a difference. All life on this planet is indebted to you and all the other brave ones who have taken the front line and stand for Earth, our beautiful home and mother to whom we are indebted. We know that your work has been for all of us and all of the future." Close quote. And those words mean so much to me after 40 years of trying so hard to bring the pressure of fact to the public about alien intelligences on our planet and that some are behind the disturbing, bloodless, trackless animal mutilations and human abductions that do go on. But there are some other intelligences that have performed miraculous healings for people. So there is always the confusion of who is our ally and who is not. Who has lied to humans for centuries while other intelligences have tried to spread the truth that we are not alone in this universe and that other intelligences come here from other parts of this matter universe? from other dimensions beyond this matter world, and even from other timelines, according to some cases where intelligences have said they are beyond where we are, that they come from another dimension, that they come from another timeline. It's our challenge to understand if that is true, who, what, and why. Now I am receiving hundreds of letters every month like another one from Michelle in West Sussex, England, who back in October of 1969 saw a large UFO above the back garden where she lived. And she did this sketch for me and said, quote, it looked like a bangle bracelet on its side with oblong windows which were lit up and then just went across toward the wood at a speed I have never seen anything travel and then it was gone. 
In the last five years, I have had vivid dreams of severe weather, like multiple tornadoes on the ocean and containers being washed up on land, and many dreams with different extraterrestrial ships. Some dreams have alien beings that have appeared full face, like greys, a reptilian with the vertical pupils in the bottom of her sketch, and a Nordic to the far lower right. And she said, I've had some disturbing dreams of being pulled physically by my ankles along with blue iridescent orbs floating by the bed. All these things leave me wondering about so much. And I hope in my lifetime, I will get some answers for all of this strangeness. I love your Earth Files program and I adore your cats. It's always a pleasure to watch and I hope we will all get the truth soon. We are definitely not alone in this universe." Close quote. Then there are the terrific Earth Files chat comments, which make me laugh out loud, like this one last week on August 28th from Westfall 2, when I reported about the half mile long oriental gray alien type head carved in black rock that is emerging from rapid melt of, in the Admiralty mountain ice on the Southern Ocean side of Antarctica. Westfall 2 wrote in August 28, 2019 chat comments, quote, I'm tickled pink to see this report, Linda. My jaw dropped, my brain freaked. I was out of my chair and chasing my husband down to show him. Incredible, Linda. Thank you so much. We've all been waiting for this one, right guys? Well, I think the half mile carved head emerging in melted Antarctic ice is another important beat in the increasing drum roll of news coming from the South Pole continent, where Spartan One in my video whistleblower series describes walking in huge halls and rooms made out of black basalt, which reminds me of the black rock, whatever it is, behind this strange face. And there in the halls and the walls that Spartan One walked, they were covered with hieroglyphs and symbols and even star maps. We in the Homo sapien sapien family are owed the truth about the ancient aliens and their waves of various civilizations that have manipulated Earth long before Homo erectus first stood up in Africa only two million years ago. And I'd like to shout out now to Miranda Panda. I hope I continue to make you smile. Martinez One, may the sound of my voice always be a comfort. And nickname four, reporters have to say, quote, unquote. Forsberg Three, Colonel Angus Four, Liverpool Five, Martinez One, SI Four, Cody Four, Duncan five, McLaughlin three, Beth R five, Kelly five. Oh, I so appreciate your positive feedback on my Antarctic Oriental alien head report. And Disclosure Team Liverpool, I am happy to continue sharing my knowledge of hybrids and aliens as my live streams evolve in the next months. Locus 4, Thompson 3, Robinson 4, Fernandez 4, Klotz 4. Thank you for boosting my morale. An associated world, word 4, thanks a lot for missing my reports when I'm traveling. And to Bryson Higgins Kelp, happy birthday. And a special thanks to all of you the chocolate and fluffy lovers. I understand because I love them too. In the words of Nobel Prize poet Anatole France, quote, until one has loved an animal, a part of one's soul remains unawakened, close quote. Before the horror of Category 5 Hurricane Dorian's 185 mile an hour wind destruction of the northern Bahamas this week. 
From our moon came China's announcement that its current lunar mission rover, U-2-2, back in late July, came upon a small crater on the backside of the moon that contains a strange gel-like substance of unusual color. So far, there aren't any firm answers, but some scientists have suggested that gel might be like the melted glass that forms when meteorites strike the moon's surface. Showing a sense of humor in this photo, the China National Space Administration released this U-2-2 photo of its tracks leading to the mysterious crater gel, along with these words, quote, U-2-2, thinking, I hope there aren't aliens in that crater, close quote, Chinese sense of humor. Now, speaking of aliens on the moon, there has always been so much high strangeness on Earth that famous UFO investigator John Keel titled one of his books in 1971, Our Haunted Planet. And it was French astronomer and UFO investigator Jacques Vallée who stated in his 1988 book, Dimensions, a case book of alien contact, quote, let us start with a simple fact. Man has always been aware that he is not alone. All the traditions of mankind carefully preserve accounts of contact with other forms of life and intelligence beyond the animal realm. Even more significantly, they claim that we are surrounded with spiritual entities that can manifest physically in ways that we do not understand and spiritual implies from another dimension. This whole issue that many things through history have been coming from other dimensions into this one without humans understanding. And one of those ways discussed more and more now in the 21st century are interactions with other dimensions, real other dimensions where frequencies are different from this universe's dimension Hypothetically, other dimensions have advanced intelligences like this universe who know how to move in and out of different frequencies. So that would mean they can pop into this matter world and pop back out, sometimes taking material objects with them that disappear from our reality. And sometimes those jumps between dimensions might include odd jumps in timelines. Those interdimensional jumps could explain why a piece, a place like the mysterious Bermuda Triangle off the coast of Florida, has reported the disappearance of at least a thousand people over the past 100 years. Planes and ships suddenly are gone without explanation. One, was a brand new yacht in 1958 with a family aboard having fun at sea. And suddenly it's like a crack rips open between the Earth's frequency and another dimensional frequency. The boat disappears completely from our world. But 19 years later, a freak powerful tornado does something to that crack between dimensions that brings the 1958 yacht instantly back to where it had been in the Bermuda Triangle on a warm, clear morning in 1977, about 90 miles east of Miami. This leads to an extraordinary interview that I have done with a military source who provided me his DD-214. Roger, as he asked me to call him, not his real name, is today 61 years old. He grew up in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, and after high school graduation, he immediately enlisted in the U.S. Navy, beginning on August 5, 1976. Roger was on active duty for six years until 1982, followed by another 26 years in the Navy Reserves. Now, I would like to share with you Roger's extraordinary August 
1977 military experience with high strangeness. Sit back and listen in radio broadcast mode to Roger's first-hand experience in the Bermuda Triangle and his first-hand knowledge of using terahertz frequencies as weapons against UFO technology. I was assigned to work with a team of NATO scientists, but I was on board the USS Richard E. Byrd. The first event happened in 77 in the Bermuda Triangle. And that's how I got involved with the team, because I was a photographer on board, and I was responsible for documenting anomalies and all that. But in 77, it would have been probably around August, we had a horizontal vortex, okay? We were all told to keep our mouth shut, but we had a horizontal vortex, nothing on radar, nothing. It was like blue skies, and it just appeared out of nowhere. So we're on board a guided missile destroyer. It was around 6 p.m. in the evening. We had blue skies, calm waters, no winds. I mean, absolutely calm. Okay, And we had a developing storm cloud off our starboard side about a quarter mile away. And no wind, no noise, nothing. It just appeared. And as it grew, it was horizontal in nature, and it was as if it was rotating counterclockwise. It would be a mere image of a tornado. The whole structure was like a tornado, hurricane combination, because it had the purple clouds in it, it had black clouds, and it was rotating counterclockwise. And the closer we got to it, we noticed its height was probably, oh my gosh, easily 400 feet, 500 feet, maybe 1,000. It was big, okay? If you were to go in an airplane above a tornado, and you look down inside the tornado, that's what we were looking at looking inside the eye of the tornado. Do you mean that if you took the classic tornado that is photographed and then you turned it down on its side on the water so that you and the scientists are looking through the top of the tornado down to the bottom of its funnel? Right, correct. That's what we saw. And it was what color? Anywhere from dark purples to greenish and it, it was strange in the sense that if you have that much cloud activity and rotation, the seas themselves should have been churning, mm -hmm. and they weren't. They were calm. It was like absolutely calm. Underneath of it, you could see underneath the ocean, there may have been maybe four feet from the edge of the water up to the cloud structure, maybe five feet, but it was calm. It just didn't add up. We're thinking, wow, there should be some type of agitation to the ocean, but there wasn't. Could it have been a hologram? I thought it was interdimensional. I thought it just appeared, but it lasted for about 15 minutes, and then it dissipated within a minute. It just disappeared. And what we saw floating on the ocean was a yacht. The boat was launched December 8th, 1958, from Fort Lauderdale. We know this because there was a logbook. We boarded the brand-new yacht, about a 35-foot yacht. When we boarded it, I went down below. There was a galley there. There was a table, and on the table there was breakfast food, and the breakfast food was not moldy, but it was cold. But it was odd because there was scrambled eggs, a cup of coffee, there was milk in a container. And I looked and there was no mold at all. Where are the people on board the yacht, right? Mm -hmm. There were no people. There was nothing, just the food. In the logbook we discovered, it said that a doctor and his wife in 1958 set sail with their two daughters from Fort Lauderdale. He described a beautiful day. Day two in the morning, he woke up. He says, a beautiful morning. Paragraph two, the wife is making breakfast. Paragraph three said, 
there is a storm forming on the horizon. No weather anomalies were updated through the Weather Service, and that was the end of it. Is this log page dated December 8, 1958? It was December 9th. Now, what's odd is that we get back to the ship and we contacted Washington, and within 20 minutes we were told to torpedo the yacht and speak nothing of it. It was classified. Yeah, we blew it up. How was that explained to you all? It never was. What's unusual is that we had a brand new yacht, and, and I remember the skipper even said, we can take it under tow at low speed. It was like, no, you will not. You'll blow it up. What did it look like when they blew this yacht up? It just shattered. It just it was an actual yacht. I was standing on board the yacht, okay? So wherever it was and however it came back here, I don't have an answer, okay? All I know is while in the triangle for a period of four years off and on, I have seen numerous occasions, everything from the lights coming out of the water to everything you hear people talking about, it's true, okay? And we were always told it's confidential the Russian technology. They're lying. You know, this is an absolute lie. Yeah. But we did our job and we kept our mouth shut. You know, we had on board the ship, we were given experimental devices and that they were going to be used in anti-submarine warfare. And I know that a lot of times we were told that if you encounter any abnormality, light, whatever, turn the device on, and aim it in their direction and document what happened. This was a general description by somebody in authority that if you mm -hmm. encountered at sea or anywhere... Lights, okay? So a lot of times in a triangle, we would see abnormalities. We were given a device that looked like a radar dish, that you can move it around. We were told it was an experimental weapon to be used for submarine warfare. My question is, submarines are in the water. Why would you be using some sort of a dish that emits a signal above the surface of the water at an object that's unknown to us? And is a glowing light. Right. And the authorities told you that if you saw a glowing, unidentified object in the air or near the water, mm -hmm. that you were to aim this dish at it? Yes. And what would happen? We never got the chance to try it out. Did they show you a film from others aiming the dish no, at... No. Nope. They never did. Did the senior authorities explain what they had seen happen when the dish was aimed at the UFOs? Nope. Never did. Did they use one of two terms? Microwaves or terahertz? Yes. Terahertz. And that this would be a dish that could project terahertz at the UFOs. Right. And then what is it that they ask you to report? What happened after we used a device? Without any other explanation? Nope, no explanation. Did you ever hear from anybody anywhere that had aimed mm. the dish at a UFO that had terahertz frequencies emitted from the dish, and what happened? They crashed. Okay, who told you and what did they say? Well, a friend of mine who works on the team that I was with had a situation, and it was basically landlocked. It would have been out somewhere in Nevada. Uh, I don't know where, but they had the same device, and they had gotten reports to go to this mountain, and they did. And he said that they used a device that an anomaly came in, and it hovered and they used it, and it came down. And also, I know that I can't tell you for sure, but again, we know that during World War II, they were already building devices to counteract these UFOs and to communicate with them. And that knowledge, after the war, went to two countries, America and Russia. So we know that we continue to either communicate and work with these grays and or whatever. Because remember, and you've seen it, the military has a book we put out that will identify 
51 different types of unknowns, everything from the grays to the, the lizards. It's all there. I don't know if what they're being shown is actually of this dimension or not. So what is terahertz frequency? I've done a lot of reporting about this having to do with uh, Rendlesham Forest, bismuth magnesium zinc, so many aspects of my research in just the last decade. This word terahertz has come up. And when you go to places that are like physics dictionaries or Wikipedia, you will hear these words. Terahertz, abbreviated THZ and sometimes called T rays, is a unit of electromagnetic wave frequency equal to one trillion hertz. Terahertz electromagnetic wave frequencies are higher than microwaves, but lower than infrared radiation in visible light. Unlike X-rays, T-rays are non-ionizing. Ionizing radiation, such as X-rays and gamma rays from radioactive materials, carries enough energy to break bonds between molecules and ionize atoms, which damages organic life. Now, where we in the public come in contact with terahertz that is supposed to be non-damaging is in airports. When we go through those body scanners and they are looking to look through the cloth that we wear, look through our suitcases, looking for metal and liquids. But you have also heard me on the radio, on television, and in many, many reports at earthfiles.com talk about terahertz frequencies the past few years in connection with my investigations of the December 1980 Rendlesham Forest event in which Airman First Class John Burroughs was twice engulfed in high strangeness light phenomena near the Woodbridge Bentwaters Air Force Base on December 26th and December 28th of 1980. We went to England with Prometheus Entertainment to produce the 30th anniversary return of Jim Penniston and John Burroughs with me to go back and see if those men being back there on the 30th anniversary would recognize anything and would actually be able together for the first time in 30 years, be able to be there at the forest in that area and find again the part of the forest that they remembered encountering a blast of white light. And in an area where John was twice exposed to light. So we were walking for four or five days on that same land that John Burroughs had been 30 years before. And we got back, it was January 1 of uh, 2011. And within a month, John Burroughs became very ill. And in 12, 2012 to 2013, he was hospitalized and doctors were telling him that he had liquid that was building up in his lungs and it was serious and it had to do with the fact that his heart was failing. And eventually, John would have open heart surgery on December 18th, 2013, from which he survived after a new artificial mitral valve was put in his heart. And that year before, in 2012, John and I and Nick Pope and others had been getting information about a UK report that we've called the Condine Report about unidentified aerial phenomena associated with UFOs that emit terahertz frequencies that can damage uh, organs that have hollow parts, like a chambered heart. So in our discussions, we had also talked with physicist Hal Putoff at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Austin, Texas in 2012, leading up to what became so serious, John had to have surgery. 
Well, in the discussions with Hal Putoff, the physicist, I had uh, been working with him off and on ever since 1996, when Hal uh, Art Bell and I had received at uh, Coast to Coast, uh, first a shipment of aluminum, then a shipment of uh, layered metal that I'm going to show you right now a photo of. And I took this photo back in 1999 on a project that I was doing in Philadelphia. And this shows you how uh, extraordinary the layers of the um, what's called the bismuth magnesium zinc layers. As you see, the silver, each silver is about 100 to 200 microns of uh, magnesium and, and zinc. And then in between each is sandwiched a very thin one to four microns bismuth. And it goes like that for about 30 some layers in only about a quarter of an inch thick. That's what you're looking at. These are remarkable. And this layered metal had come to us at Coast to Coast in 1996 from an army sergeant who told us in a series of letters that his grandfather in the late 1940s had been in a security team surrounding a crashed wedge-shaped UFO that glowed for three hours from material on the underside of a UFO that apparently had come down uh, in the White Sands Proving Ground below one of the Oscura Peaks. And that the grandfather eventually watching the underside of this wedge-shaped UFO glow with light, he was in a position in which he sneaked up, apparently after a lot of people were gone, and he pulled off some of the, what you're looking at, some of these once glowing layers that the Army Sergeant sent to Art Bell and me to investigate. And I have been working with a variety of labs and scientists ever since over the past 22 years. The layered material is still a mystery in many ways, but one of the keys to its, a func to its function appears to be terahertz frequencies. And ironically, the same terahertz that Roger in the audio says our government has tried to use to develop weapons to shoot down UFOs. Well, among these dozens of scientists and labs that I've worked with to investigate the bismuth magnesium zinc over the last two decades has been Dr. Hal Putoff. He's a physicist with an electrical engineering degree. Uh, he is the, the founder and CEO of the Institute for Advanced Studies in Austin, Texas. And by 2012, Dr. Putoff was talking to me about terahertz frequencies and wanted to see a, yet again, he'd handled this material before, if the bismuth magnesium zinc piece that I had for research might react in various high, very high terahertz frequencies and maybe even turn into a lifting body, one that would be where gravity would be neutralized. But Dr. Putoff didn't have the technology then to do the test, and he wrote me a letter on his Institute for Advanced Studies stationery on September 24th, 2012. And he said, as I indicated in earlier communications, there remains yet one additional test that really needs to be done and which I recommend that could, in principle, still provide a significant result, but which unfortunately we could not carry out with the instrumentation available to us. This relates to the observation that bismuth channels of the one to four micron size seen in the sample, the layered between the magnesium in the size uh, of the uh, uh, alternating layers of bismuth and magnesium zinc, that layered between the magnesium layers of the one to four micron 
closely match in physics literature a waveguide structure that permits sub-wavelength terahertz signals to propagate freely through the waveguide even though sub-wavelength in size. And this is a very unique property of these specific materials and their dimensional structure due to an unusual negative refractive index characteristic over a particular well-defined frequency range. And then the numbers that he has in the letter to me indicate a very high frequency that takes special equipment to reach. In fact, these frequencies are bumping up against the speed of light. That's how high they are. Now, ter terahertz also came up in a UK study called the Project Condine, or more formally, a 468-page report, Unidentified Aerial Phenomena in the UK Air Defense Region, Executive Summary, Scientific and Technical Memorandum, number 55200, originally classified in December 2000, secret UK eyes only, and released six years later as unclassified on May 15, 2006, by the Defense Intelligence Analysis Staff. The release came after 2005 FOIA request by Sheffield Hallam University lecturer in journalism, Dr. David Clark, and his colleague Gary Anthony. Well, by February 27, 2015, after John Burroughs had had the heart surgery to replace his mitral valve, and we all had been discussing terahertz frequencies, how to understand them, why certain frequencies could be used at airports allegedly safely, but could be possibly the damage to John Burroughs' heart at the level emitted from a UFO. And what Roger was describing in his interview to me, that the uh, terahertz frequencies were also being experimented with in our government as a weapon system against some UFOs. Well, the bottom line about the implications of what had happened to John Burroughs in uh, Rendlesham was summed up in a February 27, 2015 Earth Files report about John's heart damage. And I said to him that it is described in the Project Condine report from the UK that exposure to UAP radiation, unidentified aerial phenomena, can cause damage to the human body and can manipulate the mind. And those words we had shown, underlined, in a page from that big UK report, that's a quote, can damage the human body and can manipulate the human mind. And John Burroughs replied, quote, the Project Condine report is the closest thing to a smoking gun that's out there right now, next to the fact of recovering a UFO craft and bringing it to the town square, uh, proverbially, of the world, and everybody being able to see and discuss all of this publicly. And what I mean by that is to have proof of a craft. The implications are that the craft have been recovered but no one in the public yet has the proof, as far as I know. But this is a report about unidentified aerial phenomena that emit terahertz frequencies that can damage human bodies and manipulate human minds. And it was for UK eyes only until it was finally released as a highly classified intelligence study on UFOs. And it's complex. I think this is why the general so-called mainstream media avoids so many of these subjects, because they are complex. It's difficult. You have to uh, burrow into these complex reports 
You have to study and investigate the physics of terahertz frequency, where it's amazing when you discover that when you look at an electromagnetic spectrum fan that goes from radio waves up to x-rays with all the electromagnetic frequencies in between, terahertz are in their own section above where they overlap between infrared and microwave. They are extraordinarily important and so difficult for us to understand. And all of this, I wanted to emphasize tonight, on this September 4th, 2019, Earth Files YouTube live stream, and that will go to video. Because of this recent interview that I was able to do with a former uh, Navy military person who was exposed to the concept in, of terahertz being used to develop weapons to shoot down the very UFOs that the Unidentified Aerial Phenomena Report from the UK was describing as being emitted from UFOs. If we only knew the whole truth, if we only understood just straightforwardly, who are the allies? What are their ships like? What do they do? What do they want from planet Earth? And who are not allies? In what category of hostility? Do they emit terahertz frequency like weapons and that's what we're trying to mimic? And if so, it's clear that trying to understand that bismuth, magnesium, zinc, this is a key. This is a key to so many things and it was sent to Art Bell and me in 1996. And I set about to try to investigate. I had a notebook that had approximately 30, 40 labs that I went to, including Carnegie Institute. Art and I shared a $900 bill and split it. And I was living in Philadelphia then and I drove to Washington DC and spent an entire day with Eric Howry, God bless him, God rest his soul. He passed away last year. And he was the ion microprobe uh, investigator. And we wanted to find out was the magnesium in the magnesium zinc layer? Did it have unusual properties compared to normal magnesium in earth? And I will remember <coughs> that Eric said, you know, what's unusual is that I keep getting 60 times the amount of ions from the magnesium layer in that magnesium zinc piece you've brought compared to the normal magnesium that we had there as a baseline control. And he said, when I look at the bismuth, bismuth is next to lead on the periodic table. Usually you find uh, molecules, atoms that are related to lead in bismuth and vice versa because they're next to each other. He said the bismuth was pure. And all along, here we are in 2019, and the ability to generate the high frequency numbers that Dr. Hal put off suggested to me in his 2012 letter is still a challenge. And some of those frequencies are pushing right up against the speed of light. It is almost as if the very fact that UFOs always seem to have changing color and light, that it is some sort of an indication of what is happening in those craft, at what frequencies and what colors about what they are doing. And I hope tonight, I've got about 10 minutes left, and I would like to take some of your uh, question and answers to this presentation, knowing that it's been complex, but I feel that we're getting so close to that huge worldwide headline, we're not alone, that other intelligences have been coming here for millions of years, UFOs are part of their technology, 
and that you and I as fellow human beings, we deserve to know what our governments know, what our military knows about other life in this universe. And that these complex concepts, terahertz frequencies, seem to have a real key and that our own government is doing research. And in a way, everything that I've reported tonight from Roger, the military person, through just touching on the surface some of these aspects of the bismuth magnesium, that we are just around the corner, just so close to having some hard physical data presented to us, maybe finally, along with an introduction to non-humans that are allies, who knows what to call them anymore? Non-human allies, and, or maybe humanoid alloys. Maybe as Spartanum One has said, we are the product of them. We are a genetic experiment and we're all related. It's like being inside of a thousand crystal facets and we get glints of pieces of truth. But until we are shown the entire light on the outside of all the crystal facets, it's like we're in a maze that it just always seems to be unfolding into more and more branches of mystery. And so on that note, welcome to my path. I would love to take some questions and I'll try to answer shortly. Uh, about what I've talked about tonight. Peggy? Hi, Linda. I'd like to take a quick moment to thank some of our uh, Super Chats. Renee Cruz, thank you so much for supporting Linda, as well as Brenda Doyle and Rachel Dolly Hug. Thank you for supporting uh, Ursula. Oh, thank I you. I have a question. Yeah. I'm oh, sorry, Linda, I didn't mean yeah, to. No, no, thank you, thank you. Uh, I have a question from Rachel Dolly Hug. She asked, Well, you know, the way I can answer this comes via a physicist who was working on ring lasers at two places, MIT and Wright-Patterson. This goes all the way back to 1982, three years after I had uh, begun my work on a strange harvest that was broadcast in 1980, so two years after that. And uh, this physicist, in hours of discussion, told me he knew that we were dealing with other intelligences in this universe that move point to point, and that when he, with all of his classifications, working on ring lasers at MIT and Wright-Patterson, put in a request for Tesla's patents, men in black suits showed up at his lab and told him that he was his request was denied, that he was never to put in requests for Tesla's patents again. And in his discussion with me, his motive was, he said, Linda, I have studied some of your work and you are definitely on the right track. And I want you to know that as a scientist, it is as frustrating to me to know that the black world and the white world we need all of the scientists to be involved. The white world scientists need to know what Tesla was working on, what I was denied, and we're not going to make progress as long as we are in a country where the huge black underground of science related to UFOs, back engineering, ET technology, and the suppression of Tesla patents that have been kept from the white world scientists for decades. And I think that that was one of the most important discussions I've ever had with a real scientist trying to work in the white world and being denied Tesla's patents. So Tesla's patents, maybe Tesla was inspired by alien intelligence, Maybe Nikolai Tesla 
was a hybrid. Maybe Nikolai Tesla was part other and us and placed here for exactly the reason that he was pointing, having to do with his scientific work of learning to generate frequencies in which we wouldn't have to pay electric bills. We would just have things that would go into frequencies in our atmosphere for electricity. It's complex also. I really thank you for that question. And Peggy, is there another? There is one more from Scott Anderson. And he asks, when are you going to release more interviews about the discovery in Antarctica? As much as I can, I will. Uh, this has not been an easy path at all. It's been rugged as can be for me, for Spartan 1, for Spartan 2, and even some of the others in SEAL or other military categories who have reinforced what I have reported privately. They would like to give me information that I could use publicly. And it is a constant challenge because these guys get hurt. Someday, I hope here on Earth Files YouTube channel, I would like to be able to show you an interview with Spartan 1 and Spartan 2 about everything that happened to them, their families, and their lives after I began unfolding part 1, 2, 3, and 4 here at their request, at their encouragement. I got a communication from Spartan 2 who said, Linda, Spartan 1 and I, we are really taking it hard with what retaliation we're getting, but we want you to know we're proud of what you have done. We are grateful for what you have shared. And we, just like you, are waiting for that big headline. We are not alone in this universe. It is preposterous to continue on this planet with all the chaos that is happening socially and politically and geophysically and not be told absolutely the truth that alien, extraterrestrial, whatever word you want to use, pre-ancestral, humanoid types, waves of civilization have been on this planet throughout this solar system for millions of years, exactly as that Defense Intelligence Agency analyst told me in December of 1999 that I've mentioned here before. Linda, our government knows and has proof that three competing in conflict, extraterrestrial civilizations have been manipulating this planet Earth by terraforming and harvesting genetic material and manipulating genes for at least 270 million years. And when I said, sir, what is the proof? He looked straight into my eyes and he said, it's too dangerous. If I told you we'd both be in danger. This is crazy. This is absolutely crazy. The people are in danger, feel like their lives are threatened because it has been since World War II, the unfolding revelation that other intelligences are with us on this planet and beyond. On that note, next week, I promise, I'll take lots of your questions.